So, so maybe tell us a little bit about the actual crusade itself. You know, when 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 uh, the crusaders actually reached and arrived Jerusalem, and and it must have been quite a bloodbath. Um, that that whole event. Yeah. Yeah, so what happened, I mean, you know, when the Crusaders left, uh, many, in fact, uh, so the the first group that left were were peasants. They were just peasants. They, they became known as the People's Crusade, led by a man called Peter the Hermit. And they were just simple, simpletons, and they wanted to go on their own thing. Uh, but they were just, they were, they didn't get that, that far. They were, they were killed off by some Seljuks, uh, Muslims. I think when they're trying to cross Anatolia, they were killed off. Um but you also had uh, crusaders massacring Jews in the Rhineland uh, because some sites saying, well, why are we fighting the Muslims all the way over there? We have these heathen Jews, murderers of Christ over here. Why don't we kill them instead? And that's just what they did. So, so this kind of this disorder, chaos in some, in some camps, uh, not knowing what to do. Remember also that I forgot to mention that the other reason behind the crusade was not just because of the propaganda you had the byzantine emperor <coughs> alexius comnenus who wrote a letter to urban ii the pope asking for assistance against the muslims seljuk muslims because they're gaining ground and territory uh you know uh, uh, against them and so uh this is probably because of you have the very big battle of manzika 1074 alp ursalan against the Byzantines, a great victory. Um, but the, the the key thing is, is that Alexis Komnenos is Eastern Orthodox. That's the Eastern Church. But still he feels the need to write to his rival, the Catholic Church, Pope, uh, asking for assistance. Uh, Urban II does use that in his preaching and say, we have to help our Eastern brothers, call some brothers, therefore, to show, therefore, that there's still unity between them uh, when, it, when there needs to be unity. Uh, and it also shows, therefore, that, again, the power balance, the power struggle, because that's the Catholic Pope, you know, coming to defend the Eastern Church. Uh, and that shows, of course, a great power of the of the Catholic Pope. So it's kind of it's a it's a win win situation for Urban II in his mind. And so what happens? Crusaders first they travel to Constantinople first, then they go down to Jerusalem. So they go there, they go there to try and see. But of course, it's a bit, it's a bit of a ruse because they're not going to be staying in Constantinople. And Alexis Komnenos doesn't trust them either, in fact. Uh, so there's, there's tensions and stuff like that. But when they come down to Jerusalem, um, they're, they're capturing uh, you know, states along the way. Uh, Nicaea, of course, is one of them. And, and there's the coastline as well. Um, so the coastline, of course, uh, you know, Sidon, um, uh, Beirut, uh, the, the, the coastline of Sham, they're, they're attacking these kinds of places. And so, in fact, I'm not sure if Sidon and, and Beirut were taken in that case, but, you know, Ni Nicaea was taken, you know, by the Christians. Um, and and when they get to Jerusalem, uh, the 30,000 the odd who initially left, there weren't 30,000 anymore because many died along the way, very long journey, very laborious journey. Uh, many went back home because they couldn't deal with it. Uh, but those who did survive and they got there, uh, there's very, uh, it's a lot of accounts, uh, very, very um, explicit accounts, very detailed accounts in the works of uh, William of Tyre, uh, in the deeds of the Franks, Albert of Aachen. These are crusading chroniclers who chronicled the crusades. Um, and they, and uh, sorry, the Gesture Francorum, not William of Tyre, he came later, but Gesture Francorum, deeds of the Franks, or Albert of Aachen's account and other accounts as well. That there was such a frenzy that the there was a there were kind of cries of dus volt dus volt in Latin, which means God wills it, God wills it, which kind of meant that whatever evil that they do and killing of innocent people and women and children, dus volt dus volt, God wills it, God wills it, if God wills it to happen, it's going to happen. It's interesting that Thomas de Torquemada, who was the first Grand Inquisitor in the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, his statement was Dios la cuer, Dios la cuer, which means in Spanish, God wills it, God wills it. So you see the same kind of mindset. And so uh, when they get there, uh, they lay siege to uh, Jerusalem. Sadly, there was chaos on the Muslim side. The two sons of 
uh, Malik Shah, who was the uh, the Sunni uh, Sultan uh, uh, of the of Seljuks, uh, they were fighting against each other. You know, uh, Muhammad and Bihar Karuk were uh, against each other when as <laughs> Al Quds is being is being sieged. Um, you also have the Sunni Shia divide as well. But it's another third thing which is really worth mentioning that in, <laughs> in 1094 or 1092, I think, no, 1094, 1094, you had a very interesting year. Sorry, 1092, I think it was. Interesting year called, which they called the year of the death of the Khalifs. And it's called that because in 1092, that's three years before the crusade was announced, you had the death of Nizam al Mulk. Nizam al Mulk was an amazing statesman. He was a Seljuk, he was a Seljuk uh, uh, wazir working for Malik Shah, the Sultan. But Nizam put so many things in place. He was a, a, a statesman for 30 years. So, so, you know, he was very experienced in that. He dies, 1092. That same year, like a month after him, the Sultan himself dies. Malik Shah dies. And then the next year, the Fatimid Shia Khalif dies. And then like a month after him, the the Sunni Khalif dies also. And then the wow. Fatimid Wazir that's, dies. That's five. Well. <laughs> that's five. Yeah. So five people all together. So imagine the instability. Muslims wouldn't know how do you, because that means the political landscape has altered significantly. How would they? The whole leadership in, in all segments yeah. have. No, gotcha. I don't know. I, I don't think we know that the Crusaders knew about these things. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but certainly it would have really affected the morale of the Muslims as the Al-Quds, the third most important sanctity for the Muslims in Islam, is being besieged for the first time ever by these uh, you know, Western European Crusaders. Um, and so therefore, when the Crusaders arrived in, there was again religiosity. So you had Bishop Adhemar. Uh, he, he instructed Crusaders to uh, walk barefoot and fasting around the walls of Jerusalem because he said that it's going to, you know, you're going to have God's divine favor come upon you if you do that. Um, and by the way, there's also things about crusaders. They they believe that they found the uh, the true cross, part of the true cross en route. You know, they found the true cross uh, or the holy lance. They had these kind of things that they believe that they found that the actual lance, they believe that uh, Jesus was pierced with <coughs> the true cross he was crucified on. But they use these kind of artifacts, these things, just to boost their morale mm -hmm. and just to show the fact that motivation. God is on their side. Yeah, motivation for them. And so when they entered into into, uh, into Al-Quds, it was a bloodbath, like you mentioned. It was in the account of Ibn al-Athir, uh, you know, 70,000 were massacred. Other accounts, it was less than that. But still, it's going to come into the thousands uh, all the people seeking sanctuary in the mosque were all slaughtered, men, women, and children. In the kind of thing of Albert of Aachen, it, it, it's very grotesque. It says even the crusaders would, would take babies and, and, and smash their heads against walls. Um, and then you have these very gruesome accounts of the, the blood coming up to the, uh, the horse's knees, I think, or ankles. And, and this account is not a realistic account, but what it does is it's tapping into what the Christians believe of divine vengeance. So the Christians, again, because they're writing for audiences back home who didn't come on the crusade, but wanted to learn about the great victory that they had, they wanted to justify this event as being one that God approved of. And they had to therefore give um, uh, you know, imagery that comes from the Old Testament. When God destroyed nations like the Moabites and the Maccabees, the Old Testament nation that God destroyed, these were the images being used about the blood flowing in the streets. Therefore, they just utilize that same kind of imagery and just put it in, you know, for, for, you know, for the Muslims being that kind of enemy that God then destroyed in this instance as well. So that's what happened. Wow, it's uh, quite, uh, quite an event. Um, so, so what, what next? I mean, what was, what was the, I guess you know now there's there's obviously you know all these caliphs have have died recently and you've got this happen and you know so I'm I'm sure the morals of the Muslims were pretty low 
at that point and and what what were kind of the early response to to the crusades by by the muslims yeah again good question uh so what happened is that so because you had the this fragmentation in in Bladish sham and the lack of uh you know effective leadership political leadership in the Bladish sham with the seljuk authorities um the khalif of course is in baghdad and it's quite a distance from where they are um the, the the earliest responses we have on record uh number one is going to be this um uh this text authored by uh, a faqih shafi'i faqih from damascus called ali ibn tahir as-sulami he authors a text called kitab al-jihad uh his book and poetry within it and arguments within it is discussed at length in my book the cutting edge of the poet's sword muslim poetic response to the crusades um, but what he what he argues is a very interesting book because it's it's, it's a long text um, that the book was written it was uh, read uh, in in public gathering public readings in parts because it was a long text but he's making the case for a jihad that becomes obligatory upon every Muslim against the Crusaders uh, he's arguing for the show, showing of course that the fact that the sanctity of Al Quds which is so dear to us as Muslims is being violated and taken and we have a responsibility to 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 recapture it the fact that there is a obli- obligation upon the muslim khalif to to act in, in and, and bring the muslim armies together so it's kind of a textbook for uh, promoting the jihad against the crusaders and that was the, the first the first text that we had you know from that period uh as a response to the first scholarly response to the crusades Aside from that, there were poets. There were poets like uh, Ibn al-Khayyab, who was a very early poet, and he authored a text. Uh, it's a 50-odd line poem. All of it is translated in my book. Um, and in that poem, what's interesting, in fact, in his poem and also other poems from that period, is that there's a lot of internal blame, a lot of kind of self-blame. It's, in fact, not so much hatred against the Crusaders. It's more about why did we let this happen to us? And it's internal blame, meaning we've got to fix up the house of Islam, that the rivalries between us has led to this, the division, dunya, your 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 love of the world has led to this. You know. Do you have any do you have any couplets that kind of stand out to you in, in these yeah, so, uh yeah uh, if, if Ibn al Khayyab, one of his he, he says um he said uh, he said uh uh al kufr bil islam al dayman yatulu alayhi din al najib and here in these lines he's speaking about the way that women's uh, inviolability and sanctity is being is being you know ripped apart that everything he says that was once forbidden is now become permissible and all that was safe and protected is now become uh, you know uh, you know exposed uh, another poet called um, uh, what's his name? So you had uh, Ibn Khayyab, you had uh, Al Abi Wardi, uh, Abu Mazafar Al Abi Wardi. Uh, he writes a poem, and it's a very famous poem. Even the lines today are very famous. He begins his poem by saying, uh, He says, How can the eyes sleep? At a time of disaster like this, that would awaken uh, any sleeper when your brothers are sleeping in the bellies of vultures. You know, that's kind of the opening line. Then he's calling, the, the, the poem is again calling for jihad against uh, the crusaders. So therefore, you had the first responses who came from poets, but you also had this text of of uh, Al Abi Waradi. And you also had, of course, you had some attempts from the Fatimid, because remember, that it was the Fatimid, Fatimid Shia who were in control of Al-Quds uh, at that time. One year before the Crusaders arrived, they defeated the uh, the Seljuks, and then they were the ones who were in that particular time in control. And there was a few expeditions coming from their power base in Cairo, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't strong enough to 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 battle against the Crusaders.